Welcome everyone to Huddle Up with Gus, where we talk to our guests about how sports shape their life. I'm your host, Gus Ferrat, 15-year NFL quarterback, and I'm joined by my longtime friend and co-host, Dave Hager. You can now find us under the big top with the Sports Circus and Ringmaster Sal. Look for us on AMP TV, A-A-M-P TV.com. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Hot Up with Gus. Uh, today, Dave, I think we have our first Olympian on the show. Three-time Olympian. Three-time Just Olympian. Really excited. Yeah. So, Dave, we're really excited. Uh, you know, we're brought to uh, all of our fans by some great people, Radio.com, and uh, we're one of their original podcasts, and also Amp TV, and we're under the big top with Sal the Ringmaster in the sports circus. So, we're really excited to be a part of them, and also... Uh, you know, we love to talk about our favorite hotel out in L.A. The St. Bonaventure. Yeah, so the yeah, Bonaventure Hotel, the Weston Bonaventure Hotel out in L.A. We're proud to be uh, one, of, one of their great people that they love to sponsor. So um, today on the show, Dave, we've got our book, everybody. It's right here. We're so excited to have our three-time Olympian. Um, one of the show that you love to tell me about, um, Survivor. Survivor. We're going to hear about that today. We're going to hear about her time in college. So we're really excited to have um, Elizabeth on with us. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us on the show. Um, it's great to have you. And so um, we always start with, what was that first time in your life that you fell in love with sports? Can you remember back that far where you said, "I, I got to do this"? I remember being a baby and having, I don't really remember being a baby, but through my parents, I knew that I had a lot of energy and I just literally could not come down without being in the water. And so that was my first taste of maybe being a swimmer one day. And so then I remember my first like dream come true moment was making the Olympic team at 15. And eight years before that, I watched my first Olympics on TV as a seven year old. And I remember watching it and being like, I am going to do that one day. I'm going to go to the Olympics. And I remember, sorry, can you hear that, like, knocking? No, you're good. Can you hear that in the background? I'm so sorry. No. Hey. I, uh, hold on. Can we pause? I'm really yeah, sorry. Yeah, go for it. This is, like, really annoying <laughs> no, me. I'm no. so sorry. Dad! Dad, can you, like, close the door or something? It's really loud. Okay, thank you. That, that might be our I'm first. Sorry. That's, that's, that's going to be our first social media clip of Elizabeth yelling at her dad <laughs> to close the yeah. door. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel bad because I'm never here. Like, I don't live here anymore. And I'm like, Dad, stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> no, that's awesome. So you were telling us about your first <laughs> oh, memory. I'm sorry. Um, you want? <laughs> We so, okay. What? No, you were telling us about your first memory of that first time you were in the pool. Okay, so let me just, like, let me, like, start. Oh, yeah, go for it. I'm a mess. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so, yeah, I think one of the first times that I truly knew I was an athlete was obviously being a baby and going to the Mommy and Me classes with my mom and just having this insatiable energy that needed to be burned off. Um, and that turned into me joining the swim team. And then I remember being seven years old and watching my first ever Olympics on TV. And it was sort of a carbon copy of what everybody else experiences of their first Olympics. You know, you're on your family couch, you click on and you put on your sport. And my sport was swimming. And I remember watching it and seeing Misty Hyman win the gold medal in the Turner fly. And seeing her on the podium and the American flag being hung down from the ceiling and being like, I'm going to do that one day. And eight years later... As a 15-year-old, I did that. And so between 7 and 15, I was like, diehard swimmer. That was my life. I was going to do whatever it took to be an Olympian one day. Um, and then from then, my career just kept getting better and better and stayed with the sport for another 10 years after that. Now, so. Elizabeth, did you play other sports, though? I know you had to dedicate yourself to swimming. But, like, early on, did you play soccer, like a lot of kids? Or, or was it really, like, swimming right from the beginning? Oh, no, I did soccer, basketball, ballet, surfing. Um, I was super into music, so violin and piano were really important to me. Um, but I felt like swimming, I always 
was drawn to more so than the other sports. And so for me, I, I, I never really questioned as a swimmer. The other sports were me just doing things because I was competitive and really enjoyed them. But at the end of the day, I identified as a swimmer. Well, being from the ocean state also, that was a natural, right? Yeah, that is, I mean, you kind of have to go swimming all the time. Do you know Rhode Island's other nickname? No, I Besides do. Besides it, Little Roadie. Little Roadie, right? Isn't it true, Little Roadie? Little Roadie. Yeah. I know, it is. I mean, small state, you know, we're the Roadie Rams the, at URI. <laughs> the Roadie Rams, I love it. So, do you think in any way that other sports you played helped you uh, be better, be a better swimmer? I think so, and and I think balance in my life was a huge contributing factor to my success later on in the sport of swimming because when I was little, yes, I was so drawn to the sport of swimming, but it wasn't everything. It wasn't who I was yet, um, and I think being able to you know go to basketball practice or violin lessons or whatever it was that I was doing, it sort of gave a sense of balance in my life where, hey, maybe if swimming didn't work out, I still had other stuff on my plate. And I think it's hard, especially at that age, to dedicate yourself to one thing because you might be good at swimming at seven years old, but maybe not good at swimming at 15 years old. Right. Um, so to be able to have different skills and assets that you, you can use later on in life, I think is really important, especially as a young kid, especially because when you're seven years old, you pick up everything like it's nothing. You know, whether it's a language or an instrument or a sport, it's just your, your mind is a sponge. So it comes a lot easier to you. So for me, it was really just having that balance in life. And I'm grateful that my parents provided that for me because I wasn't driving myself to any of these things at seven years old. Um, but my parents were willing to put in that sacrifice for me. So I definitely think that that helped me in the long run for sure, being a plumber. Like, did you know, was it, was it pretty evident pretty quick that you were gifted? I think so. I, you know... I took to the water very early on, you know, at six months old. So I knew the water was where I sort of was most comfortable. I joke that swimmers are water athletes and then there's everybody else. And that's like the normal athletes, like land athletes. And I, I sort of knew that land sports weren't my thing. Um, and so around seven years old, eight years old, I started breaking New England records, you know, more regional stuff. And then slowly after that, breaking national records. Um, so I do think I was one of those athletes who really just showed promise at an early age. But the thing with any sport is that you could really excel at something at seven, eight, nine, ten years old. But that doesn't really mean that you're going to be incredible at it at, at, a, at 20 years old. Um, so where I was very talented, we sort of erred with caution and being like, okay, she does, you know, have some promise in the swimming world, but we're going to keep up with the other sports and the other extracurricular activities, just in case this swimming thing doesn't work out. One of the things I'm interested in is finding out, because I think swimming, you have to have a mental intensity like no other sport, right? Dave, you get to go out and run and, you know, switch if you're playing baseball or football, you're doing a lot of other things. Swimming is, I'm in the water, I'm whatever swim I'm doing, whatever stroke you're doing, and you're in there for hours. And it, you, you have to have a mental intensity, and you can't hear anything. So kind of describe that for me, what that was like for you and how you got through that early on. Sorry, you cut out. Um, yeah, being a swimmer is probably one of the hardest sports in that you are in your mind the whole time. You're not talking to anybody. It's just you and your thoughts. And so... For me, it was almost a blessing in disguise because I'm, I'm a naturally extroverted person. And although I am an extrovert, I do need alone time sometimes. And it seemed as though swimming was almost my getaway where I would come home from a really long day at school or whatever it was and then be able to just dive into practice and think about whatever it was that I needed to think about and be in my own thoughts. And then, but also do that while being with teammates. And I think... You know, swimmers definitely do have an innate ability to focus because we have nothing else to do other than stare at a black line for three hours in a practice. And right. it's all about your timing and your stroke count. And, you know, you're thinking about technique the entire time. So it's one of those things where if you're going to dedicate three hours to being in a 
smelly chlorinated pool and being bored, you might as well, you know, make the most of it. And so I think that was one other thing that I really took from swimming is that if I'm going to show up, I'm going to show up and do it well. I'm not going to waste anybody's time, mine or my coaches or my parents, whoever it was. So I do think that swimmers definitely have have a, a special ability to be able to focus and really commit themselves to something. Now, now your mom was a very accomplished swimmer herself, right? Go ahead, say it again, Dave. Sorry, oh, did you, miss you, you broke up completely. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you, now, your mom was an accomplished swimmer in her own right. So, my mom grew up swimming at the YMCA um, and then was basically a lifeguard at all the Rhode Island beaches in the summer. Um, but I, I don't think she would ever really label herself as accomplished. She's super humble, um, but definitely far more accomplished than just the average Joe swimmer. Um, so I definitely did have a little bit of swimmer gene in me. And then my dad was the complete opposite. My dad played football, like ran, like did not really do the swimming thing. Um, and, and we joked because my mom is definitely the swim mom. And then my dad is not really a swim dad in that. I could tell my dad I went like 20 minutes in my 50 free. And he'd be like, honey, was that a best time? And he'd be like, no, not even close. But it was a great balance for me in my house because... I had my mom who really knew a lot about the sport and then my dad who knew enough about the sport, but it wasn't his sport. You know what I mean? And so I really had a great balance in my house um, when it came to my parents. And, you know, my mom and my dad drove me to practice every single day. They made sure there was food on my plate. Like, I would not be doing this interview with you guys had it not been for them and the sacrifices that they make. So I'll just take this chance to thank them for everything that they've done because whether it's me or you or a anybody in the world that's in the world of athletics, you know, you can't do it without that support system. And I was really lucky to have a good one. I'm um, sure. So, so you, you go on, you start swimming at seven and you're going through your life. You get into high school and um, I'm sure that you're, like you said, you're breaking records in high school. And then what was that first time where you said, Oh, I could swim in the Olympics. Where did you find, how'd you find that out? I think there was always an inkling in the back of my mind that I could be an Olympian, but it's one of those dreams that's so crazy. You never want to fully believe it because you, you almost don't want to set yourself up for failure. So even when I was 11, 12, 13 years old, showing a lot of promise to maybe one day go to the Olympics, it was one of those things where I thought I could do it, but never was really fully committed until actually happened and I think that's like you you don't want to get your hopes up and so for me when I finally made that Olympic team it was a sense of relief almost being like wow like I really I really did it you know I believed in myself and I knew I could do it but then also like surprised too because was I really 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 expecting that I could do it it was almost like oh if I do it that's great if I don't oh well um, and then especially for me to do it at the age of 15, I think it was a huge shocker to me and my family and everybody close to me because I'm the youngest on the entire United States Olympic team. And I have basically just come out of nowhere. And that's sort of a cool thing to do, too, because I was just this scrappy 15 year old girl that just showed up to Olympic trials and was like, hey, I'm here to race. You know, I've got nothing to lose. I'm not at the end of my career. I'm only at the beginning. So. Why not take advantage of this time? Well, also being, I, th I believe this is true, being from Rhode Island, that's unusual in itself to be such a good swimmer. I mean, the people on the, the team with you are probably a lot of Californians, maybe Florida, whatever, but not, not, not upper northeast, right? Never the upper northeast, at least not for swimming. You know, we have the lacrosse players, the oh, hockey sure. players, but... Yeah, and I remember growing up and showing promise in the sport and USA Swimming reaching out to my family and being like, hey, we've noticed your daughter. She seems like she's really on track to do something special here. Might you not consider moving to Florida or Texas or California? Because that would open up your training options tenfold. You know, there's one team in the state of Rhode Island. Um, and, and my parents and myself, we, we sort of made a decision where we were like, 
No, you know what? If we're going to do this, we're going to do it from Rhode Island. I don't want to uproot myself for something that's not guaranteed. Um, so for me, it was basically putting my foot down and being like, I love where I'm from. I love Rhode Island. I can do this regardless of where I'm living. And it was cool, too, because the last Olympic swimmer from Rhode Island before me in 2008 was a woman named Clara Lamore Walker in 1948. Wow. Wow. So for 60 years, there was not a single Olympic swimmer from the state of Rhode Island. And so that was also something that was kind of on my radar as a girl growing up in Rhode Island was, hey, I want to break this dry spell that our state has had. And I, I'm, I'm just so happy that my parents supported me in staying here and really just sticking sticking it out, for lack of a better term, I guess, um, and really believing in my coaching staff and, and myself and knowing that hey, maybe we're not in Florida or California, but we can still do pretty amazing things being from Rhode Island. So well, so what was that experience like in high school? Because, I mean, I played in high school and played every sport, and, you know, you kind of get that sense of people know that you are good at a sport or whatever, but here's an Olympic athlete going, I'm going to high school with. What was that like for the people around you and your friends? I mean, it had to be crazy. I would be lying if I said the adjustment back after the Olympics was easy. Um, <laughs> it, it seemed as though, you know, I had my niche group of friends, you know. I had my, my close friends heading into the Olympics. And, and the thing that I loved most about my childhood and growing up was that my swimming life stayed at the pool and my school life was at school. You know, people knew that I swam, but they did not know I was going to the Olympics. And so... I was just like, oh, the swimmer girl, whatever. And then I come back from the Olympics as a sophomore in high school. And now all of a sudden, people are making this massive deal about me. You know, people are whispering, that's the Olympic swimmer girl. You know, there's newspaper articles hanging from chalkboards and classes. And I'm like trying to concentrate and my face is staring right back at me. Um, you know, I, it was just like everybody seemed to all of a sudden want to be friends with me. And... I guess that was a lesson that I learned early on in, like, who has good or bad intentions, you know, who actually wants to be my friend for me versus me being an Olympic swimmer, and that's cool. But it was it was crazy coming back to school because, like, didn't have my license. I was just trying to fit in and be a normal girl. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm trying to go to Walmart or something with my family, and people are taking pictures of me. So, I, and by no means am I, like, a celebrity, but... In the state of Rhode Island, at that time, me being the first Olympic swimmer in 60 years and just being a local girl and the only Olympian from Rhode Island during those games, it was almost like a bigger deal, you know? And, like, had I been from California or Florida, I could have gone anywhere and nobody would have recognized who I was. But because I was in the state that I was in um, and the small town feel that Rhode Island has, uh, I think it was definitely a bigger deal than maybe it would have been elsewhere. Well, so it was it was a crazy adjustment. One thing I see, Dave, is I, I think she took it very well. She didn't seem very shy. She's not shy. She's not shy. She has a lot of fun, and I'm sure that enthusiasm <laughs> went through, especially when you're wearing a medal or coming back from the Olympics and everybody wants to take pictures. I'm sure that was a lot of fun for you as well. It was so much fun, and it made me feel like I brought the state together, even if it was just for a week during the Olympics. Valet, stay, and play on your next getaway to Los Angeles. The Weston Bonaventure Hotel and Suites offers effortless access to all the City of Angels has to offer. Whether you're hoping to catch a concert or sporting event, our hotel is just moments away from all the action and accessible to Hollywood, beaches, museums, and theme parks. The package includes a guest room and valet parking. For reservations, use promo code PSF in the code box when making your online reservation. Or call 1-213-624-1000 and ask for promo code PSF. So, Elizabeth, you already have an Olympics under your belt before you even decide on college, I guess. That's kind of an unusual step in the process. So, I'm sure also you could have gone, at this point, to any college anywhere for swimming. How did you choose where you went? Yeah, so it was it was crazy going into college recruiting as an already Olympic swimmer because obviously you're going to be the top recruit heavily recruited everybody wants you um and so for me I narrowed it down to three coaches uh and schools that 
I knew were going to fit what I wanted academically and athletically. So I knew at an early age I wanted to go into some type of journalism, broadcast communication, something along those lines. Um, and I knew, obviously, I wanted to be a successful swimmer. So the three schools I narrowed it down to were University of Florida, University of Texas, and Cal Berkeley. And I had personal relationships with all three of the coaches from the Olympics and World Championships, meets I've been to prior. And they all had great journalism communication schools. And ultimately ended up choosing the University of Florida um, because I knew that coach the best. And that coach had a very good relationship with my club coach. And in swimming, I I'm not so much sure about football or any other sports, but in the swimming world, it's very rare for you to have a turnover in coaches. Maybe you swim for two to three coaches your entire life. Um, and so those coaches have a very strong integral part in your success as an athlete. And so for me, I also wanted to leave my club coach, who was named Chuck, and go to a school for a college coach. And I wanted that college coach and that club coach to have relationships. And that was super important to me. And so Chuck and Troy, who was my college coach, had a very, very good relationship. And so we almost had like a triangle um, line of communications where I would always talk to Chuck and Chuck would talk to Troy and then Troy would talk to me. And so it was just a very, very nice feeling to have going to school and uproot myself, but know that I was in good hands and nothing was going to be too new or too... I, I guess scary to deal with and foreign. So right, so that's why I chose Florida. So one thing I'm, I'm, it's going through my mind when you're talking about all this. When I first went to college, and I was okay in high school, and then go to college, and you're wondering, can I make this? Can I do this? You're going to college as an Olympic swimmer, and to me, it's like, you know, were you, were you nervous? Like, were you just? feel like you were right at home, like you got in the pool and there was, you know, nobody can keep up, I'm going to lead this team. How was that feeling for you? Because for me, it took several years to get to where I was good enough to lead the team and be one of the best on the team. Yeah, I think one of the things that I went into swimming at University of Florida was, I'm only a freshman. It doesn't matter that I've already been to the Olympics. Just because I have been to the Olympics doesn't mean that I'm automatically a leader to these people. They don't know me. I have no right to boss around the seniors who have really created the culture that I'm walking into. And so I think for me, I sort of just observed my undergrad years as a freshman and a sophomore and was like, all right, this is the culture of the team. This is how the seniors and the juniors lead. I'm going to follow their lead because swimming at UF, you know, it's one of the best schools in the country for swimming. So even though I've been to the Olympics, it's still a step up in my training and that I'm training with now fellow Olympians. Whereas in high school, I'm training with just some high school athletes. You know, I'm the only Olympian there. So I was able to learn a lot in the years that I was swimming at the University of Florida because my teammates were Olympians. And so it's cool to be able to learn from those other athletes and whether they're from the United States or Poland or China or wherever they are, um, it's really cool to see a different type of training um, and start to implement styles that they have into my own training. And I think that's one of the cool things that University of Florida had was such a diverse foreign program where I was swimming with athletes from all over the world. And what we do here in the States is far different from what they do in Australia. So it was almost like an exchange of ideas and knowledge that ultimately made us better athletes across the board. Now, I, what I wanted to ask Elizabeth about too, what, what's, I have no idea. I'm assuming it's a massive amount of training. What's like if, during swim season, I know it's for you, it's probably all the time. What, what is that training schedule like? How, how many hours are you in the pool? What do you do when you're not in the pool to prepare yourself? Yeah. So a typical, you know, hard block of training would be we'd be in the water around 10 times a week. So we would do 10 practices. We would normally double, which means a morning practice and an afternoon practice. So two practices a day. We would double on typically Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And we would single, so one practice, on Wednesday and Saturday. And then Sunday would be off. So 
we would touch the water 10 times a week, and those are two-hour practices. So we'd be swimming four hours a day, four times a week. And we'd also be in the weight room on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And that would really be probably an hour, hour and a half. And it would differ between what events you swam. So I am more of a distance swimmer. So I would lift a lot of uh, like higher reps, but less weight. Whereas the sprinters, maybe more so like a, like a fast football player would lift. We're doing cleans and snatches at a very high weight, but only like one or two reps. Um, so I would be in the weight room three times a week. And then another three times a week, we'd be doing dry land, which for swimmers mean we'd either go for a run or walk up and down the stadium stairs at the University of Florida um, stadium where we play football, um, crunches, abs, more like body weight exercises. So we would be working out close to 30 hours a week, I would say. Um, and that, that's sort of like what you have to do to be a swimmer because swimming is a sport where you're in the water, obviously. And I think because us as humans, we're not naturally water athletes. So if we take a day off, it's almost like our body forgets what it's like to be in the water. And, and the rule in swimming is if you take a day off, it takes double that amount of time to get back to where you were. Oh, wow. So if I take a day off, it's going to take me two days to get back to where I was. If I take two weeks off, it's going to take me four weeks to get back to where I was. And that's, that's the swimming protocol. So it is a sport where if you're not willing to dedicate and put in the time, you're really never going to reach the success that you possibly could reach if you were to put in the time. So, right. So what, that's you, a lot. what year were you in college when you went back to the Olympics? I was a sophomore. So I had just finished sophomore year and then swam in the London 2012 Olympics summer between my sophomore and junior year. Um, so similar to my high school experience coming home, I figured, oh, I'm going to University of Florida campus starting my junior year. It's a campus of 50,000 kids. Like, no way people are going to recognize me. And of course, you know, it, it wasn't a ton, but, you know, I'd be in a big lecture hall of 300 kids and the professor would be like, and I just want to announce that we do have Olympic medalist Elizabeth Beisel in our class. And I'm like <laughs> hiding in the back, like trying to shy away because I, you know, I just, it, it's just so funny because I'll say this to people that I talk to when they make a big deal about me. And I'm like, guys, literally the only thing I do better than you is swim. Like, like that is the only thing I might be better at you then. And so it's, it's just like, it's cool though. You know, on the other side of it is you don't know who is cheering for you or who wants to be like you as a little girl. And they, they look up to you. So it is cool to also play the role model role for, little girls and boys growing up and, you know, wanting to be an Olympic swimmer one day. But I do think it's funny because I feel like I'm just a normal average Joe that swims a little bit faster than you. Right. Right. So I I think Elizabeth was, she, as soon as she hit Florida, she was setting SEC records, et cetera. Like it wasn't like a slow transition. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like there was no, like I had a big transition in college. She, she, yeah. Like she, she wanted to know the culture. She was already dominating everything out there. Out there. So um, I want to say thank you to all of our fans again for joining us on Huddle Up with Gus uh, and uh, listening to us on radio.com and joining us under the big top of Sal the Ringmaster and Amp TV on Hotel Television. So one of the other things, Elizabeth, that I'm really interested in is you go at 15. Everything had to be you had to be starry eyed when you go to the Olympics at 15. And now you're back at 19 or 20, somewhere in there. Tell us the difference between the two times and how you felt, and if that made a real difference in how you swam. Yeah, it made a massive difference in how I swam, how I acted. It's like, you know, going to your first Olympics or first Super Bowl or whatever it is that sort of your dream come true and it's finally here. I found myself focusing too much on what everybody else was doing. So I'm a 15-year-old. And I'm, a te- I'm on a team with a 23-year-old Michael Phelps, and he's one of my heroes. And all I wanted to do was copy whatever Michael did. And where, yes, maybe some things that Michael did also worked for me, but not everything Michael does is going to work for me. 
And I sort of learned that the hard way at those Olympics because I really wasn't giving myself what I needed. I was too focused on, oh, Michael does this before his race. I need to do that. And a lot of those things didn't end up working for me. So I learned through that Olympics to take a little bit of stuff from here and there from different athletes and shape it into my own routine. Um, so by the time that I made it to my second Olympics at 19 years old, it sounds crazy, but I'm now a seasoned veteran and I know what to expect. And I think one of the craziest things about the Olympic Games is I had pictured it, you know, it's the pinnacle of our sport for swimmers. It's the biggest stage you can swim on. And I picture the village to be this beautiful Western hotel with amazing shuttle systems and great food. And candidly, it's the complete opposite. You know, you walk into the village and it's a bed with a sheet, um, no pillow. You know, there's no comforting accommodation. The shuttles run here, there, everywhere. You never know if they're on time or not. Um, and, and it's a far cry from what I had experienced at like a world championship when we're staying in a five-star hotel. So that was also a huge culture shock because you think, oh, I'm at the Olympics. It's going to be amazing. This food's going to be great. And you're like, wow, I don't even know what I'm eating in this dining hall. Nothing's in English. I don't know where I'm going. What bus do I take? And so it's, it's, it's mayhem. It's organized chaos. So going from Beijing in a Chinese-speaking country and going to London, an English-speaking country, that also helped my transition as an Olympic athlete. It, it might sound funny to say, but... It does make a difference. And so for me, London, I just felt much more at home, at ease. I knew what to do as an athlete. I knew the language. I knew the food. Um, so it, there are a lot of factors that go into play when it comes to the Olympics and, and where you're from, honestly. Are you, are, when you're in the village, are you, you're mixed with all the other countries, right? Are the, are, is the U.S. team separate from other teams or, is, or are you guys like a dining hall? Or are you just, everyone's mixed together? The dining hall is fair game for anybody. And I'll never forget, this is one of my favorite stories. I'm 15 years old at my first Olympics and it's our first trip to the dining hall. And I want you to picture this massive warehouse thousands and thousands of square feet and there's all of these food stations mediterranean mexican like anything that you want and i think i went into like the mexican line and i'm standing behind this six foot clothes and i'm like oh wow that's cool jamaica like i wonder what he does and it was usain bolt and that's just like <laughs> the olympic village you know you run in that you see on television that you have posters of in your room. And I think that's the coolest thing because, you know, a small town girl from Rhode Island at the Olympics is in line behind quite possibly the greatest Olympic track star ever. And it's just like, Oh yeah, we're getting food at the Mexican station today. <laughs> um, and, and it is, it's just, it's athletes that you see on ESPN and NBC and all these major um, networks, you know, doing what they do best. And you're like, wow, I'm actually here on the same stage as them. You know, like, that's pretty cool. And, and I'm sure it had to be different, too, because you were, uh, uh, you know, you're still a kid, kind of, 15, and then at 19, you're more of an adult, and then all of a sudden you go to your, your third one. You know, I, I can't imagine what the changes people saw in you as well as what you saw in yourself. Yeah, I think one of the biggest changes that I saw in myself and definitely the other saw was, you know, at 15, I was definitely more reserved than I normally am because although I'm an extrovert, I'm intimidated by the entire situation that I'm thrown into. You know, 15-year-old girl from Rhode Island, the next oldest person on the team is in their 20s, don't really have a lot of friends. I'm just trying to find my way. And then fast forward eight years later to my third Olympics, and I'm now 23, much more seasoned, I know what to expect, and I'm voted team captain. Wow. And so I sort of went from this, like, loner girl who had no idea what was going on to, you know, the girl that knew what was going on and the girl that people turned to when they were nervous or when they needed to know something about what to expect. And so for me, that was a really cool full circle moment, moment for me because I saw 
those first time Olympians come into that team where it was my third time around and I knew exactly how they felt. I knew what they needed, whether that was guidance or what to expect or what the nerves are going to be like. And so it made me feel good that I could really help those athletes feel comfortable at their first Olympic Games because it's it's a very scary, pressure-filled situation. There's millions of people watching you, and it's a lot thrown at you at once in, in the time of a one- to two-week time span. Um, so for me to be able to be a captain and lead those youngsters, it was a full-circle type of moment for me, which was really special. How did your parents deal with it over those eight years from when you were 15 to 23? Um, and, you know, did you see them, like, really settle down? I'm sure you had to. At 15, they are probably nervous for you, and, and were they with you all the time? Yeah, at 15, they were super nervous. And, and like me, very, you know, we had no idea what to expect. We didn't have any experience. And so by the time the third Olympics ran around, it was like my parents were doing what I was doing with my athletes, but they were doing it with the first-time parents. And they were like, all right, so you need to get this hotel. You're going to want this block of room. Like, yeah. you do this. So it was cool because they were sort of helping the first-time parents around because I think what a, a lot of people don't really know is that when an athlete makes the Olympic Games, the parents aren't really given a block of rooms. Like, they're sort of on their own trying to figure it out. How do I get tickets? What do I do? USA Swimming obviously helps with that, but – you don't know what you're doing when you go to the Olympic Games and getting a credential and all that stuff. So it was nice for my parents to sort of follow my track um, and become almost like Olympic like veterans. They knew what to do, which was really cool for them. Yeah, that would be amazing experience as a parent. Oh no, no I was just thinking of like the, you thinking back to like your first swim meet and you looked at your parent. You know, this is when you're seven or whatever. You probably looked at your parents. They're off to the side watching. Then you're in your first Olympics or your third Olympics. You look up and they're, and they're sitting there. That's probably a pretty neat dynamic. Yeah, I just got the chills while you said that because it's it's so true that you know your parents are with you through it all, and they're the ones that have consistently, unwaveringly supported that dream. And so, I, you know, I'll never remember, or forget the time, like, after I won my first Olympic medal in 2012 and meeting up with my mom, my dad, and my brother after that race and just, like, handing them my medal and them having this overwhelming sense of, wow, like, all of those early mornings, all of those drives, you know, it was all worth it. And I think for them it was just as rewarding as it was for me because, it is a team, it's a team thing, you know, even though it's an individual sport, you know, I didn't get on that podium without them or my parent or my coaches or my teammates and everybody else who helped me. So I think it was cool for them to, you know, be there at my pool at six months old in my backyard to <laughs> me on the Olympic podium, you know, it's, it's not why I got into swimming, but you know, it is a cool outcome to have. So you then, if we go into your call, the end of your college now, you're still swimming. You graduate from Florida. So then, where do you go? Where were you training for your for your last Olympics? So I stayed training at the University of Florida, and this is another sort of swimming culture thing where if you train at a university and you go there for your four years as an athlete in the NCAA. You typically, like I said earlier, you don't want to change coaches. So a lot of athletes, what they do is they do their four years at Florida or Texas or wherever it is, and then they stay there as a post-grad to train. And so I ended up staying at the University of Florida for another three years oh, okay. as a postgraduate athlete. And what's great about that is that if you typically swim in a program where there is a lot of Olympic excellence, like there was at Florida, um, they will have a separate training group for foreign athletes to come through or American athletes. And so I was lucky enough to be training in a group with almost 20 solely training for the Olympics athletes. Wow. And that was a really, really cool just environment to be in heading into my last Olympic Games because every single person that was there training was there for the Olympic Games. And it, it's not a common thing in the swimming world to have a group of athletes that large 
all training in one spot. Um, so I was lucky enough to already be at Florida and have my coaches be the coach of that group. Um, so it just made sense for me to stay in Gainesville and finish out my career there. Start your day sunny side up at the Weston Bonaventure Hotel and Suites and enjoy breakfast for two on us. No matter how you plan to spend your trip to Los Angeles, start every day with a hearty meal to kickstart your morning. Enjoy breakfast for two on us each day you stay. For reservations, be sure that promo code S4B appears in the promo code box when making your online reservation at marriott.com backslash LAXBW or call 1-800-228-9290 and ask for promotional code S4B. I'm thinking of the co- the recruiting standpoint. That's pretty good for the coach to bring in yeah. a, a <laughs> high school junior and be like, "Oh yeah, there's what there's there twenty Olympians swimming around there today." You know, it's it's kind of helps the coach out too a little bit. Yeah, that's easy to recruit that way. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's enough said. Campus tours yeah. over. There's twenty yeah, Olympians yeah. right there. You know? I think I'll go to Florida. Right, right. <laughs> oh, for sure. Oh, wait, the, and before we get into the the post your post swimming life, I wanted to ask you about. I always hear about the like. Um, the the diets that the uh, uh, we were just well, talked about. Um, well, Michael Phelps, like Michael how many Phelps calories you have to consume? Like he consumes like twenty thousand calories while he's in training or something. Is is that true? And then like, what was your diet like? And what's a typical diet for someone training? Yeah, I think maybe early on before I knew Michael, that was probably true. Um, I know him very well now, and he's definitely not eating 20,000 calories a day. <laughs> but, I mean, for, for sure, as, as swimmers, we definitely eat on the higher end. Like, I remember going into the dining hall after practice, and football and swimming got out at the same time. And at Florida, we had an athlete dining hall. And the football guys would always look at the swimmer girls. And, you know, like, we're, we're really fit. We're muscular. Like, we're not big girls. And they'd be like, damn, how are you guys eating that much? And, like, we're filling up our plates just as much as they're filling up theirs. But it's it's such an aerobic, cardio-based sport. You know, if you don't fuel yourself properly, you're just going to be burning through muscle, and then you're going to get slower and slower and slower. So I, I definitely have altered my diet since being done swimming because if I ate, like, the way I ate while I was swimming, it would not, it would not be good. Um, but yeah, we do, I would say in my heaviest training, I was probably eating five, 5,000 calories a day. Wow. That's like that's, us, Gus, except we don't swim. Or do much of anything else. Right. I did for a while, though. I was in pretty good shape when I played football. Uh, the only problem is I didn't alter my diet. <laughs> I, I can't say the same for myself. It's, unfortunately, it's been just a downhill drop ever since I was about eight. We're still here, though, Dave. We're still here. We're still here. We're yes. still kicking. True. Um, <laughs> all right, we want to thank our guests for joining us here, and they can listen to us on radio.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, so we want to go into after your college career and uh, after your swimming career. I think it's just – what an amazing career you had. But we all have those transitions. For me, it's 15 years in the NFL. And then all it's, it's over. Like, once you're done, you're done. You know, I can still go throw football, but it's not the same. I'm not doing what I love to do forever. What was that transition like for you and that decision for you to stop? And how did you know that was the right time? Right. It was hard. And I think you can relate sort of like you're mourning a death of an identity that you've stuck to for your entire life. And so for me, it was Elizabeth Beisel, the swimmer. And it's like, yeah, I can still swim, but I'm not doing that anymore for life. And I think for any athlete, it's a scary transition because especially for us, you know, what does our resume say? You know, oh, you have 15 years in the NFL. That's great. But what are your skills in the workplace? oh, I swam in the Olympics, that's awesome, but I don't care how fast your turn of back time is. Right. That's not going to get you this job. So for me, it was like, okay, well, my resume says nothing, um, and I don't really know what I want to do. And I knew that I wanted to go into sports broadcast or journalism, whatever it was, but I didn't know what that looked like. Like, there was no clear-cut path for me. Um, so I sort of just started saying yes to everything that came on my plate. If there was a local swim meet that needed an announcer, I was like, yes, I will do it for free. I don't care. Or if there was a public speaking gig that I could get, I would do it. And 
slowly I gained a lot of experience and figured out, you know, what my niche was and started doing clinics across the country and learned that I love teaching little kids how to swim. And, you know, it's a life-saving skill. So partnered with USA Swimming and started doing a lot of clinics in underprivileged areas, you know, giving those kids an opportunity to learn how to swim for free. Um, and it sort of just molded itself into what my life is today. And I fully attribute that to just me having the mindset of saying yes to anything. And I, I can't even really explain what I do now professionally because I have a million folks in the fire, but I'm happy. And that's really what matters at the end of the day, at least for me, um, is just loving what I do. That's great. So tell us as a teacher of swimming, when you get a little baby, because I can remember this, we had to drop our kids off at the pool, and the teacher was like, okay, now you guys can leave. And we're like, what? Yeah, he's like, you cannot see how I train your children to swim, right? And I don't know if that's, if you work with little kids like that, that are still one and two years old, that haven't, you know, did that before. But we really trained our kids from a young age. And when we came back, they're like floating and swimming. And we're like, well, how'd you do that? He's like... Mm-hmm. You don't want to know. Okay. So do you, like... Do you, I'm afraid of this story right now. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, he basically just threw them in the water, he yeah, said, and, right. and they just naturally learn how to swim. He And it's just something that yeah. he did, and it's amazing. But I, I, he was right. I didn't want to watch that. So I, I'm not sure if that's, like, if yeah, you're teaching think, older and, and or younger. Me, I'm not... Yeah. I'm teaching more like five, six, seven year olds and above. Um, the little kids, I'm certainly not qualified to actually like teach you how to be in the water and blow bubbles and stuff. But right. <laughs> I think I'm comfortable working with seven year olds in that sense where these kids have been, they've seen the water. Maybe they've touched their feet in the water before, but they don't actually know how to swim and save themselves. And that's sort of like our motto is that this is the only sport that can save your life. You need to know how to do this. And so we'll get them comfortable enough where they'll come in and by the end of two hours, they can put their head underwater. They can blow bubbles. They can swim from one end to the other. And and that's really what you need in order to just prevent drowning is knowing how to stay afloat. Um, so we try to implement those skills within those two hours. But when it comes to the six-month-year-old babies, I, that is not me. I <laughs> pass. That to the Oh, not me. Yeah. Right. But um, I, I have so much respect for those people. Yeah. So um, have you found, have you ever seen or been around somebody you said, hmm, they remind me of me, right? They're really good in the water. I love watching them. And they have a passion like I had. Have you been able to f- find that person? Every so often at a clinic that I'll run, um, and these are clinics for kids that already swim. They're on a team. And I'm just there to sort of critique them a little bit. Um, but yeah, every so often I'll come across a kid and I'll try to find the parent afterwards and be like, hey, little Johnny over there, like he's got something special. And I think that's nice to hear because it's, I don't know if this is what it's like for football or any other sports, but when you watch somebody swim, you can sort of tell if they have it or they don't. And when you can tell that they have it, it's almost like you're dancing for joy. You're like, yes, one of these kids has it. And, like, they can go far if they really want to. If they really want to dedicate their their life to this, they can definitely make a run for the Olympics. But oftentimes, it's, you know, maybe they're just talented in a million other sports. You know, they're really good at soccer or football or basketball, whatever. And swimming's just like, oh, you know, something fun that they do in the summer. Um, so I always do try to find the parent and be like, Hey, I, I don't say this often, but I think your child has a lot of potential. And I'm like, maybe me saying that will make all the difference. Right. And that would mean hopefully a lot. it does, but yeah, there are, yeah. That would mean a lot. So you said you say yes to everything. So tell us how you said yes to the show survivor. Yeah. So survivor was I wasn't even looking for Survivor. So I actually got approached by CBS to be on Amazing Race with a fellow Olympic teammate of mine. They wanted to do like an Olympic or athlete edition of Amazing Race. And so I was going to be paired 
with another swimmer. And for whatever reason, that fell through. But they came back and they were like, hey, would you want to consider Survivor? And I didn't really know much about the show. I knew you, like, lived on an island. But I was in the say yes to everything phase of my life. So I was like, yeah, why not? A shot at winning a million dollars? I can't say no to that. Um, And so I essentially said yes. I went through the the casting process. And sure enough, I ended up getting picked. And we flew out almost exactly a year ago. We're in early March right now. And that's mid-March is when they start filming. And so flew out to Fiji and did the whole reality television show thing and survived Survivor. And it was it was just a really, really cool experience to sort of because they take your phone, you're completely off the grid. Um, and I think that was one of my favorite aspects of the show is that it's just you living on the beach and there's no emails or phone calls or work that you have to do. It's just you kind of appreciating nature and being out in the wilderness, as crazy as it sounds, I I really did enjoy it. Did you find, like, you're your ultimate competitor. Did you find in the show, because it's all about competition still, did you find your your competitive juices coming out? I mean, you talk about nature, but then you want to win a million dollars, so at some point you're competing. It was honestly the first time that I had felt challenged like swimming had challenged me since being done with swimming. And I was so stoked about that. I was like, give me this challenge. Like I'm going to kick all these guys, butts. like, (laughs) I don't care who they are, where, what gym they work out at. Like I'm here to play. And I think that was like the coolest thing for me because I had, I had almost forgotten about how competitive I was um, since being done swimming. Cause I've been done for about two years since then and haven't done anything at all competitive since. And so then I get the survivor and they have these challenges and it's for a million dollars. And it was like, I didn't miss a beat. Like I was back to old competitive Elizabeth. And that was, that was just so much fun to know that I still sort of had that fire inside of me, even though it wasn't swimming. Right. Uh, that, yeah. That would have been, that would have been a lot of fun. How many, how long were you out there? How long were you on the Island? So in total, Total, like when we got there to when we left, it was around six weeks. Wow. But the game of Survivor is 39 days, and I lasted 30 days. So I, w- I was living out in the wilderness for a month. So, wow. so what happens then? What, once you're no longer a contestant, you still are, like, sequestered, right? You're, 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 not, you're not flying back home. You're, you're staying on the island. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, we are. We continue to be sequestered until the final day of filming, and then that next day we fly home. So it's actually great. I always joke like I sort of got the best end of or the best of both worlds, where I got to play Survivor and live outside, but I also got a really beautiful, wonderful free vacation in Fiji, yeah. and that was also <laughs> great. You know, I got to eat whatever I wanted, sleep in, you know, go swimming in the ocean. Um, and Fiji is such a beautiful place too. It was like, wow, I'm really lucky right now. And obligations. And so it was really cool. We all stayed on this private r- resort island um, until filming was over. So two things. Surprise! You used the word sequestered. I'm, I'm impressed. It took. It was an effort to get out of my mouth. I like yeah. that though. Yeah. And then, second of all, are you still friends with the people that you were on the show with that were in that series of Survivor with you? Yeah, we are very close friends. And I think it's, I compare it to teammates on a sports team in that you go through a lot of highs and lows together that nobody from the outside looking in really understands. And so it's, it's a special bond that you have with people where you are deprived of food and shelter and comfort for a month. You know, you've been through some bad stuff. And so I think that was a bond that really solidified us being lifelong friends, which is cool because I sort of got another family out of the show, um, which I really love about that. How was that first meal once you were eliminated and you're in, you're in the resort part? <laughs> <laughs> the first meal was great for the first hour <laughs> or two. And then my stomach was mad at me for the next two days. Because oh, yeah. oh. it's like you... You literally do not eat 
for 30 days. Like you might have a coconut, some rice here or there. But my first meal back, you know, I'm so ravenous. I'm like, pizza, mac and cheese, ice cream, brownies, <laughs> oh, yeah, french that, fries. That would not be good. I'm just destroying my body. And, you know, it tastes so good. You haven't had flavor in a month. And, you know, you're loving it. You're eating it. And then your stomach starts to growl a couple hours later. And you're like, oh, God, why did I do that to myself? <laughs> and then it takes a full, like, 24 to 48 hours to recover. Um, but slowly but surely, your stomach readjusts. But, yeah, the first meal back is, it's a rough one. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I could imagine. I could imagine. All right, so before our last segment of the show here, um, I want to discuss your book a little bit and tell us a little bit about why you wrote it, who helped you write it, and how people can find it. Yeah. So the book was basically, it was never on my radar to write a book. I will say that. And then I started going to a lot more clinics and public speaking gigs. And people would find me afterwards and ask me if I had a book or suggest that I write a book. And so I ended up hearing it enough that I was like, okay, I'll think about it. And so I basically like went home, opened my laptop, and I was like, chapter one, <laughs> what am I doing? And so I was writing for a couple months, no idea what I was doing. And it was just like serendipitous that I found the woman who co-authored it with me named Beth Fair, who is an author, and we were in this open water swimming group together, and we were discussing what we like to do and projects that we were working on, and she opened up to me that she was an author, and I was like, are you really? <laughs> I was like, how would you like to help me with my book? And she agreed to it, and she is the reason why it's like done in print today, um, and, it's, and it's a really well-written book by her, and it's about my swimming career, but it's about the ups and downs. You know, it's, it's, it's a book for athletes to read, whether you're a professional athlete or an eight-year-old athlete that is looking for a little bit of inspiration, but also that notion that, yes, maybe I am an Olympic swimmer and I have Olympic medals, but I'm also a human. And I've gone through a lot of the same stuff that you're probably going through right now. Um, and it's something that I would have liked to have read when I was a child growing up through the sport because I – put these Olympians that I looked up to on a pedestal. You know, nothing ever went wrong in their careers. No injuries ever happened. They never lost. They're these perfect superhero human beings. When in reality, that's the furthest thing from the truth. You know, we go through ups and downs every single day. We want to quit. We hate the sport. We love the sport. So it's really just a tale of my ups and downs through my swimming career. Um, and you can find it on Amazon.com called Silver Lining. Um, and I think it is a book for not just swimmers to read, but all athletes or anybody who is looking for maybe a little bit of inspiration in their life. Have you had your first uh, book signing yet? Yes, I had my first book signing. It was last Wednesday at Barrington Books. It's a place in uh, Rhode Island. And the turnout was amazing. We had a and a session. Um, it was like a three hour long line to get the book signed. Wow, so that's awesome. It was a huge success, which makes me feel good. Yeah, so it went really, really well. That's great. A lot of little roadies out to get the book. Yeah. Oh, no <laughs> doubt. Sounds like it. All right. So uh, we want to thank all of our guests for joining us here on Huddle Up with Gus. And uh, they can catch us on, you know, uh, radio.com or wherever they like their podcasts. And this last segment is brought to us by MTV and, and um, Sports Circus. Uh, so, Dave, we call this one the No Huddle. So explain to Elizabeth a uh, little bit what the No Huddle is. Well, No Huddle is just... Quick, quick hitter questions. Sometimes a little bit more explanation, than, but some of them are just like one word. We just want to pepper you with a couple. Yeah, get, so, get a better feel for it. We yeah, yeah, we're going to have yeah. some little fun here. So, Dave, shoot. Okay, if you were making a Mount Rushmore of Florida Gator athletes, who would that, who'd be on that Mount Rushmore? All right, I would throw a little bit of Tim Tebow, Ryan Lochte. Um, could I add a coach? Hey, sure. it's Mount Rushmore. Steve Furrier oh, as a coach. He's a staple. The old ball um, Ooh, and then uh, Tracy Calkins. Nice. What are, uh, be, that's a she, solid group. She has yeah. given us the fastest Mount Rushmore we've ever had. And sometimes it takes like three minutes. Yeah, like, oh, she, she knew yeah. right away. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that was very good. All right, yes. What is your biggest pet peeve? Ooh, probably when... 
people feel I sit in the middle seat a lot when I'm on planes and when the two people on both sides of me take the armrest. So then I'm like a little T-Rex like this. <laughs> yeah, I hate that. That's why I sit by the window. I think window. middle seat gets the armrest. Yeah. I just hate and I hate when people assume that the armrest is theirs. I do that a lot. Like, because I'm bigger, I just kind of force my way. Like, in I almost want to, I wait and just see if they do it. And then if they take it, I go, see, that's the type of person. I'm, you know? <laughs> I hate it. You're though. just so nice. You're like, like, oh, no, that's me. You're I'm just not so cool nice. And I'm like this. Yeah. It's, hor- it's, it's horrible. Um, yeah. Okay. If you were the commissioner of all competitive swimming for a day, what change would you make? I would issue a lot more money to the athletes and prize money. And, oh, and one more thing. I, for the NCAA athletes that compete at the Olympics, I would let them keep their medal money. Oh, yeah. So you don't... There's, there's a rule within the NCAA where you can't keep your medal money. Well, hasn't that, do you think that changed now since the NCAA rules have changed that athletes can make money now? I think there might be a cap right now. I would need to like really read into it, but I know at least when I was swimming, when I won my medals, that money basically went back into a big pot. It's and it's not even like deferred. It's, it's no, 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 no. You, you do just not get don't it. get it. Oh wow! Yeah, uh. For swimmers, that's, that's huge. Like we're not signing million dollar contracts. Like yeah. we're living with that money. So I would do that. So um, if we open up your phone. And we say, okay, we're going to find the most famous person in Elizabeth's phone. Who would that be? Probably Michael Phelps. So you could That's text solid. Michael right now and he'd be like, hey, what's up, E? How you doing? Oh, yeah. Awesome. That's, That's big. That's pretty <laughs> good. Um, okay, Elizabeth, if you could trade places with one person for a day, any realm of life, any time period, who would that be? Ooh, I would probably, I would love to be a member of the Beatles oh, back. What an answer. A couple decades ago. Cause I love music. I would love to like be in a cool band like that, but just to like see their rise to stardom from the bottom to the top. I think that would be really, really cool. I love so, so can you, do they make pods now that are waterproof that you can listen to music while you're swimming underwater? They actually do have it. They're not AirPods. They're not like Apple made, but they do have a couple brands that make underwater headphones. But I, we would never use them in practice because right. we want to hear what the coach is saying and stuff like that. But yeah, they, they are available somewhere out so there. So if you could use them in practice, who would what band or group would you listen to? Ooh. I really am into Zach Brown band right now. Good. Um, they're just like good vibes, like great music. I'm really missing summer right now, and country music reminds me of summer. So that would probably be my playlist right now. <laughs> All right, I like it. Um, if you could go back in time and give yourself ten words of advice, what would you tell yourself? You broke up. Sorry, can you say that one more time? Okay, if you could go back in time and speak to a younger version of yourself, what 10 words of advice would you give yourself? I would say stop comparing yourself to others and just have fun. Everything's going to be okay. I think that'll be 11 words. I like it. I like it. That'll be a message. All right, so two more, Dave. Okay. All right, so my last one is what is your favorite sports movie? Ooh, that's a hard one. Oh, Miracle is so good, especially because we're, like, celebrating the anniversary right now. I think I would have to go with Miracle. It, it is a, it's an awesome movie. Well, I was just going to ask her what her favorite non-swimming Olympic moment is, but I think we just heard, <laughs> yeah. we just heard the answer. Right. Um, okay, how about this? Because this, yeah. this is in the pet peeve category, but it just happened to me, and it's it's annoying um, when you're at the grocery store, what's your pet peeve at a grocery store? I really dislike when people hover over something for an extended period amount of time. Like, 
Uh, normally, I know what I'm getting, so I'm in and out, and people are, like, hovering over the avocado section, touching every single avocado. <laughs> and I'm like, just pick one. It's going to be okay. No, they're, they're <laughs> acting, That's probably my best. You better go to the store. They're acting like it's, like, a wedding ring or something, but it's, like, it's just a, it's a, right, it's a right. banana, you know? Go like through the, Oh, this one's a little softer. That one's a little firmer. Like, yeah, I'm going to. Yeah. Now I just order everything on Amazon Prime because I don't have to go to the grocery store anymore, and so it's so nice. Let that, right, that exactly. It. It's You're unbelievable. Smarter than me. Um, all right, so tell everybody how they can find you on social media and uh, if you have a website. Yeah, so my website is elizabethbeisel.com, and all of my social media handles on Twitter and Instagram are ebeisel34. Awesome, awesome. So we really appreciate you joining on the Huddle Up with Gus and getting in the huddle with Dave and I. Um, it was amazing to hear your story. And, uh, you know, we'll let you know when, when the episode comes out. And uh, we hope you can share it and retweet it for us. I absolutely will. Thank you guys so much for having me on. You guys are the best. Well, thank you. And thank tell, you your da- tell your dad he can go back to pounding on whatever nail he was pounding on. I know. He's putting down a new floor downstairs. <laughs> like a porch. He's like, you <laughs> just put me an hour behind, David Gus. I know. He's like, I'm <laughs> All right, thank you. It was nice meeting you. Excellent. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Hey, we want to thank you for joining us today on Huddle Up with Gus, uh, where we talk to a wide range of guests about how sports shape their life. As always, I'm joined by my great friend and co-host, Dave Hager. And uh, we want you to be able to follow us on all of our social media at Huddle Up with Gus. And we really appreciate you and thank you for your time uh, and listening to our podcast.